Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of panel discussions. Um, and looking in the mirror, Cooperstown reflects on racism. My name is Leanne Hirabayashi, and I have the honor and privilege of co-moderating these sessions where I'll have a front seat at this amazing learning opportunity. Um, if you'll just give me a moment, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so just one moment, please. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. So one moment, please. All right, here we go. Thanks for your patience. All right, here we go. Okay. So, um, before uh, we start, I'm just going to have a little quick poll to find out um, why you decided to um, take part in this seminar. So I'm going to run a poll here for you. And if you can, you'll see it in just a second here. So I'm launching the poll. If you can start answering that, if you see it, hopefully you're seeing it. And you can answer as many as you like. Almost there, about 80% have voted. Just give it a few more, about 10 more seconds. All right, about 89% voted. Okay, so that is most of the people voted, um, and oh, got a couple more. <laughs> okay, so um, so it looks like uh, we have a, actually a, a little bit of everything, but uh, many of you are interested in learning about the topic and then wanting to learn about actions you can take as well as looking for some resources. So great, that kind of gives us a a step now I it's hard for me to tell if you can see my screen um, Namita can you tell me if my screen is on view I don't see it yet Leanne I'm gonna okay thank you so I'm gonna just reshare I think that for whatever reason it is having a little trouble so give me a moment to reshare that one moment please Thanks for your patience. All right. So I'll share that one more time. There we go. All right. So now that's visible. Thank you. Seems to disappear when I. Um, okay. So. Um, so uh, let me just briefly talk about sort of how this this panel discussion got got started and what we're trying to accomplish here. It was a response to the uh, murder of George Floyd and the nationwide protests that erupted in support of the Black Lives Movement. Um, and the goals of this pro this uh, series are to um, examine the impact of racism on our community and uh, the institutions that are part of the community. Um, so we can learn how to confront bias and inequities locally, identify any actions that individuals, groups, all of us can take to address racism to create a more equ equitable Cooperstown. So um, there are uh, four sessions this fall um, and three to four more coming in January, February 2021. 
and uh, we'll talk. I'll have a little bit more about what those are um, at the end of this session. So, um, as part of that kind of looking in the mirror, uh, I am going to risk technical difficulties to go ahead and do one more poll with you. And uh, so, let me stop. Actually, I'll stop the share and um, do the poll. I think that might work better. So, this poll very quickly is, um, do you see racism, do you feel racism is an issue in the Cooperstown area? Just take a few more seconds here to get uh, most people are responding. Just got a few more seconds. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, you know we've got seventy six percent of our uh, attendees feel that it is. Um, an issue in the Cooperstown area, uh, pretty small percent saying no, and 22% saying not sure. So that's good to know. Thank you. So I'll stop that share and hold that up. And now, share screen. Okay, so just real quick, I'm just going to go through um, a few items related to the logistics and format of this online discussion. Um, uh, so there will be a, just a couple uh, messages from the host and sponsor of, of um, this panel discussions. Um, then we'll introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, and then after the introductions, each panelist will make um, a brief five to ten minute presentation. Um, if there are presentation-specific questions from the audience or other panelists, we'll address them right after the, the presentation. Um, then we'll have a um, uh, question and answer session and discussion. And uh, for attendees, um, at the bottom of your bar, you will see um, uh, that uh, several different icons. Um, Please note that chat and raise hand, or chat is disabled and, and we are not using the raise hand feature. We're just using the Q&A feature uh, icon. So if you do have a question, just click on that Q&A icon um, and go ahead and ask it. Um, you can we go ahead and, and we see that you are already submitting questions. Just keep uh, submitting those questions throughout the presentations and discussions. Um, and uh, our, our co-moderator, who I'll be introducing shortly, um, she will be uh, moderating the questions and then asking them on your behalf. If your question is specific to one of the panelists, please uh, indicate that in your question. Otherwise, we'll assume it's for everyone. And uh, finally, uh, note uh, that uh, these panel discussions are being recorded and a link to the recording will be made available on the Friends of the Village Library webpage. So now um, a brief message from uh, the Friends of the Village Library. Uh, their mission, uh, or our mission, is to promote cultural literacy and enhance community engagement in the Cooperstown Village Library. Um, and they, we do that through advocating for the library, um, through uh, financial contributions, uh, through fundraising, and uh, educational and recreational programs. Uh, we are the the website you can see here, um, and at this website you'll see uh, you'll find a list of resources on racism that have been gathered by library staff and volunteers. And you will also 
it will be updated regularly to include recommendations and information provided by the panelists. And um, now, uh, from the League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area, um, the League is uh, grateful for this opportunity to join the Friends of the Village Library in this panel discussion. Uh, the League believes that diversity, equ equity, and inclusion are central to its current and future success in engaging all individuals, households, communities, and policymakers in creating a more perfect democracy. Um, we would like to take this opportunity of our captive attendees to um, remind the audience of some important dates related to the upcoming election. So uh, October 9, that is the last day to register to vote. <coughs> so you can go to the New York State DMV website to register online or download a form to fill out and register in person. Um, early voting is from October 24 to November 1. And uh, that's at the Otsego County Meadows Complex. Times do vary depending on the day, so go to the otsegocounty.com website for details. October 27 is the last day to apply by mail for an absentee ballot. And then November 2 is the last day to apply in person for an absentee ballot. And then election day is November 3rd at 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And it's also the last day to po postmark an absentee ballot or deliver it to um, a polling place. Um, and then we also, um, the League would like to point you to uh, the website vote411.org, which has um, just about anything you would need to know about uh, the elections you'll find there. In fact, um, it was just updated today by the um, State League um, with uh, an, an election guide for you. So strongly recommend that you um, go there and check that out. Now, let's start with our introductions. So I'd like to start by introducing uh, our co-moderator, Namita Sugandi, is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Harvard College. Areas of expertise are non-state complex societies, South Asian archaeology, political archaeology and micropolitics, ceramic analysis, origins of the Brahmi script, heritage management, decolonized, de and decolonized strategies of archaeological practice. And Namita received her PhD from the University of Chicago. Thank you for joining us, Namita. Jennifer Dibble is the organizer of the Say Their Names exhibit in Cooperstown, which just launched this past weekend. Uh, she's been involved with a fight against racial injustice for 20 years, beginning in college in Philadelphia. Uh, she has organized or co-organized co a half dozen protests and rallies in central New York. And Jennifer is the director of strategic planning for Cornerstone, which is a mental health counseling company. She is the mother of biracial children. Lee Fisher is a retired social studies teacher and basketball coach from the Charlotte Valley Central School. He is currently president of the NAACP Oneonta Area Branch and chairperson of the Davenport United Methodist Church Administrative Council and Trustee Board. Dan Maskin is uh, CEO of Opportunities for Otsego, the nonprofit community action agency in Otsego County. Uh, opportunity for Atsega's mission is to be the leader in developing innovative solutions that promote healthy lives, thriving families, and caring communities. Dan also serves on multiple boards, including the City of Oneonta Planning Commission, the New York State Department of State Community Services Block Grant Advisory Council, and the New York State Community Action Association Board of Directors. And finally, we have Will Walker who is Associate Professor of History at the Cooperstown Graduate Program, SUNY Oneonta. He's an editor of the Inclusive Historian's Handbook and the author of A Living Exhibition, The Smithsonian and the Transformation of the Universal Museum, which uh, came out in 2013. Uh, Will oversees the Graduate Program's ongoing oral history project, CGP Community Stories, and with his students regularly organizes public programs on topics related to race, class, gender, culture, and the environment. He's played a central role in developing the Martin Luther King Day G program at the First Presbyterian Church of Cooperstown and the Day of Dead Family program at the Village Library of Cooperstown. And he's organized and facilitated numerous community dialogue programs. So 
Um, with that, I am going to stop my share and uh, we will start with our presentation. So uh, Lee Fisher will be uh, first up to bat here. So why don't you take it away, Lee? Hey, thank you, Leanne. I want to first of all thank the uh, Cooperstown Friends of the Village Library Group for inviting me, Oneana Area NAACP, to this um, discussion tonight. And uh, also, um, it was nice uh, meeting all of the panelists. And uh, we're also happy to know all of you that are in attendance tonight. This was not an easy topic. Um, easy in the sense of uh, where do I start? As a black man or a person of color, where do you start in discussing racism in America? The land of the free and the home of the brave. Where do you start with racism in America? For the republic, for which stands nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Where do you start a discussion of racism in America? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inevitable rights and on these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Where do we begin a discussion of racism in America? How about the preamble? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure justice and equality, provide the the general appearance for the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Where do you start a discussion of racism in America? Should we start from the time the moment I was born? Uh, yes, I was born black. And my birthday in that box that was marked race. Wait, wait. Lee, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your internet might be going in and out a little bit. The sound is cutting in and out just a little bit. So it's a little bit hard. I don't know if you can, if, if you can adjust your microphone, if that might help. Now, can you hear me now? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Well, I, I was talking about um, where do we start our this discussion of racism in America? Should uh, should and when I first had place for race, just had a big C. And so that was the start. Uh, my, I found out that our social security numbers, mine match my wife's first three numbers. Did that mean anything? Was that something that was systemic for all of us in the city of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, that uh, that meant that you were a person of color? I don't know. Um, or should we start with uh, James to present uh, this uh, day of making America great again up to the present? America, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of thee I sing. People must study their true history 
and how from all these documents and songs of America I just mentioned, we should know how racism started in America with the first colony of Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. In 1619, the first blacks coming to these uh, shores, they came as slaves. They didn't come on the deck when the ocean was nice and smooth, where they could see the beautiful sunrise and sunset. They came below the deck, known as the hole, shackled in chains. That was their beginning. Slaves working from sun up to sundown with very strict rules of how hard to work, of how a plantation owner would have his, his property uh, pleased by savage plantation masters whose title not whip their property in order to get their point across. And after Reconstruction, there were the Black Codes, which were enforced. And then came Jim Crow by government. To keep people covered, quote unquote. Lee, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I think there's a suggestion that if you switch off your video, the sound might the the audio will will get better because it'll take up less um because i think it's still cutting in and out a little bit so people are having some difficulties hearing okay i'm sorry hopefully that'll improve the audio okay i just have a few more things here okay uh can you hear me now is it okay? Yeah, I think it's much better now. Yes. Okay, I'm Apologies. sorry. Apologies. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Sorry so, to interrupt. I, all right, just to uh, to finish up. So after Reconstruction, the Black Codes were set up, and then they had Jim Crow, and then there were all kinds of systemic laws that were instituted by the government to keep people of color, quote unquote, in their place. So. Where do you start? America. Uh, we have promises that were made. This is the only nation that I will live in and probably will die in. So racism started in 1619 up to the present day. So we're talking 401 years of racism. And racism, racism is, is deeply rooted and um, deeply rooted and culturally accepted. Accepted hate, accept, accepted uh, evilness. I'm just going to end on this note, and this is from my own spiritual note. Talking about the great commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. My father said to me so many times, You have to feel it to heal it. You have to feel it to heal it. So I hope that from this point, people understand that promises were made, but they were never kept. From the beginning to the present day, our agents go on as inferior. There have been laws that have been made that have uh, dealt with uh, our situation so that you cannot be equal. So where do you begin with racism? We begin in Cooperstown. 
We begin in Oneonta. We begin in Gilbertsville. We begin in Bainbridge. All the little small towns, all the large cities, all across this nation. We must work together. We must live together. If we want this nation to be great, that's what we have to do, stand together. Thank you, Lee. I'm um, sorry that sound was bad. That's okay, yeah. If you, if you want to, um, well, why don't I see, do any of the panelists, other panelists, do you have some questions for, or comments for Lee? Um, no. No? Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was wonderful, Lee. Thank you. Uh, Namita, are there any um, presentation specific questions or um, comments? I, I, for Lee? I, I feel like the things that I'm seeing are more general, so maybe they're better to to say for um, the uh, the last uh, towards the end. Um, and then I think someone just asked if we could please turn his video back on because it'd just be, yes. it'd be nice to see him again also yes. after um, after starting off our, our panel so nicely, um, despite yes. the technical you, difficulties. <laughs> um, but I yes. think there's also a comment about, you know, um, racist signs being displayed in Gilbertsville. And that really speaks to his comments about where all of this starts. It starts in these small towns that, that we all live in around here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, and and um, some counter protests in Bainbridge that were um, pretty difficult uh, earlier this year as well. So, yep, that's for sure. Um, okay, then why don't we go ahead and uh, have Will uh, Walker um, do his presentation? I want to say thank you as well to the Friends of the Village Library and thank you all for being here uh, to, to talk about this important topic. And, and thank you, Mr. Fisher, for setting it up so well, my history presentation, taking it all the way back. Of course, the social studies teacher would do that so well. Um, and also for your, your important words and your powerful words. All right, I'm gonna do my screen share. Okay, can everybody see that? Give me a thumbs up, panelists. All right, thank you. Okay, so I am going to kind of take it down to the level of our communities here in Otsego County uh, and look at the history that we have here of slavery and racism um, going back into the 18th century and I'll sort of carry us through the 19th century and I, our other panelists will get us closer to, to the present. Uh, a few key takeaway points. Um, slavery was not only a Southern issue. It was present in the North, especially New York State, and it was a major driver of the national economy. We have still in our culture this perception that slavery was a Southern problem. Uh, that's simply not true. It was national and there was a great deal of slavery, uh, particularly in the 18th century throughout the North um, and uh, especially in New York State. Uh, another key point to recognize about this history is that employment discrimination and a racialized labor system have been persistent issues throughout US history. You know, these are things that we still wrestle with today and they go back to uh, you know, really to the beginning. Uh, it's also important to recognize that African Americans in New York State have challenged discrimination for 350 plus years, right? That there's, there's always been resistance to this. There's always been organizing. Um, and there's a great deal of evidence, particularly in the 19th century 
of African-American political organizing right in this region of New York. Uh, and then finally, we're still grappling with these legacies. You know, the, the, the past is not past. It, it affects us every day, our lives every day. Uh, so, again, to, to bring it to, to New York specifically, um, you know, New York was really a major player in the state. Um, well, yep. I'm not seeing your, uh, I, I'm not seeing that um, PowerPoint presentation. Is. Yeah, well, I think we just see your screensaver, and I think that's what the yeah. attendees are also. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll reshare. Hang on a second. Interesting, interesting technical challenges. That I, have. <laughs> I spend my entire life currently teaching on Zoom and have never had this issue. Um, but here we go. Now we can see it. Okay. All right. Now we're probably going to have the problem of you're seeing my notes, but. Oh, okay. I decided not to show me. Perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, well, you heard my key points. You didn't see them, but uh, slavery was not limited to New York City, right? I think there's also perception people who know anything about um, slavery in New York think it was really confined to New York City. It wasn't. It, it uh, expanded not just into the Hudson Valley, but into other regions of the state. Uh, here are some numbers. I won't read them, but uh, you can see that you know, this is a significant percentage of the population, particularly in the early 18th century. Uh, New York had the higher, highest percentage of slaves of any northern colony. Okay. Uh, and you can see that those numbers increased throughout the 18th century, and we'll see, in fact, into the early 19th century. Um, so by the end of, this is, you know, after the revolution, 1790, the end of the 18th century, we have almost 26,000 African Americans in the state, 82% of whom were enslaved. Bring it to the Otsego region. Um, you, we, of course, they're much smaller numbers because there's a smaller population in, in this uh, region in this time. Um, this is a period, of course, we need to recognize immediately after what we might call indigenous removal. Um, that the, uh, the indigenous people, the native people who had been present in this region because of the American Revolution um, were forced into other parts of New York State and into Canada. Um, so in that, into that vacuum, you have Euro-Americans, Euro white settlers coming in and, uh, and enslaved people as well. And so you can see that even, even relatively early on in terms of settlement in this region, you did have enslaved people here in 1790. There were eight in the town of Otsego, and then there's some discrepancy, but somewhere between 55 and 96 in the town of Kanajahari, which parts of the town of Kanajahari were in what is now Otsego County. Okay. Uh, then around the turn of the 19th century, you know, again, the numbers increase uh, in Otsego County specifically to a peak of, uh, in 1810, you have 74 enslaved people, 133 free people of color. And then after that, the numbers start to decline. These are all numbers that are coming out of the U.S. Census. Um, whenever I talk about history, I, I like to not just talk about numbers, but also talk about people. Right, and we do actually have uh, some evidence of uh, named enslaved people, and a little bit of a sense of their what they were doing and what their experiences might have been. The, the evidence uh, is very limited, but it's not entirely absent. So, uh, for example, we have some information about Joseph Stewart. You can see he's actually pictured here in this painting of Elizabeth Fenimore Cooper. Uh, he was uh, enslaved to the Cooper family um, and uh, was a, 
a, a servant in their home uh, as an enslaved person and then as a free person um, for over 20 years. And so this is the only image uh, from that period of an enslaved person that we have. And, and you, if you're walking around Cooperstown, you can actually visit um, the gravesite of Joseph Stewart. He's buried in the Cooper family plot at Christ Church Cemetery. This uh, is an ad uh, that was placed anonymously by William Cooper, uh, the founder of Cooperstown, in uh, the Otsego Herald, um, uh, September 5th, 1799. Uh, this was an ad where he, as you can read, was putting uh, his uh, enslaved person, a, likely a woman named Rachel, uh, up for sale uh, for $200. So, you know, that really speaks to um, the, the value of enslaved people that, uh, you know, that, that much of the economy was driven by uh, the, the value of enslaved people and their labor. And of course, it also points to the, the, the real tension at the core of slavery, which is these are human beings who are legally uh, designated as chattel, a, as property. Right? Uh, there's some sense in the, the, this story uh, that uh, the, the, the sale did not actually happen, that this may have been a strategy to, in a sense, control this enslaved person. Um, so it's, it's also an example of perhaps some resistance Uh, this is a, um, what we might call a runaway ad, or more recently, people have talked about uh, self-liberation, right? Uh, this is, uh, again, placed by a member of the Cooper family in the Freeman's Journal in 1824. Uh, the text is a little hard to read. It says, the public are hereby cautioned against harboring or trusting my slave Harris, who has left my service, as I will not pay any debts thus contracted. Okay, so this is... This is hard evidence, right, of the existence of slavery right here in Cooperstown, um, but it also it's telling us a little bit about how enslaved people were practicing agency, that how they were actively resisting uh, th their enslavement. We do have some other names uh, of individual enslaved people in Cooperstown, uh, not much more information, if any, about them, but uh, Betty, Sarah, and Lizzie uh, were also uh, enslaved to the Coopers, um, and uh, Scipio uh, was, um, is buried at the Christ Church uh, Cemetery as well, um, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, known burial uh, of an individual enslaved person um, in New York. Uh, and then do know a little bit too, uh, more about the, the last two individuals. Um, uh, Tom, Thomas or Tommy Bronk uh, was enslaved to the Averill family. Uh, and kind of like jo Joseph Stewart, uh, he made the decision to stay on working as a, a free laborer um, with the Averill family after, uh, after uh, he uh, was emancipated. Um, and then Joseph Tom Husbands, or Joe Tom Husbands, this is a photograph of him, uh, was, uh, came with his family who were enslaved uh, in probably around 1815 uh, and was freed at some point after that and stayed for many years uh, in the village and uh, was a well-known uh, figure uh, in Cooperstown um, doing various types of labor and uh, uh, working as the um, Sexton of the uh, of Christ Church. Okay, um, so slavery officially ended in New York, uh, July fourth, eighteen twenty-seven. There were a series of gradual emancipation statutes from seventeen ninety-nine on, but uh, it, it was not officially abolished in New York until July fourth, eighteen twenty-seven. And we, we actually had here in Cooperstown an emancipation celebration on that day at the 
Presbyterian Meeting House, which is the first Presbyterian Church of Cooperstown. Um, and there were uh, there was a speaker, Hayden Waters, a local free African American, and other African Americans who attended this this celebration. And that is the subject of the historical marker uh, in front of the uh, Presbyterian Church today. Uh, that was unveiled uh, last summer. Um, and uh, instrumental to the process was uh, Tom Heights, Sharon Stewart, who uh, you know, did much of the, the legwork and the research to, to make this happen. Um, and uh, it, it was also unveiled, another marker about Susan B. Anthony, which I don't have time to talk about, was, was also unveiled the same day. couple more things I wanted to draw your attention to. So the uh, emancipation celebration could be seen as part of a broader effort uh, amongst African Americans uh, to organize politically in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. So you start to see what was called the colored conventions movement. These are large gatherings of African Americans who are organizing to essentially exercise political power. Um, and, and here's an example locally of this. This is an ad from the Freeman's Journal. After that emancipation celebration, September 24th, 1827, um, put in, in the newspaper by Hayden Waters saying, to the people of color, let's gather and, uh, and, and organize you know, for, um, to promote the general good and the future happiness of our race, right? So that, that tradition of activism and resistance, you know, goes back at least this far and really it goes back farther than this. Uh, one of the reasons that they had to organize was because emancipation did not equal equality in New York State. And this is true throughout the North. Uh, you know, even though you have a very strong anti-slavery abolitionist movement in New York State and Massachusetts and other places. That did not mean that white people in the North supported black equality. Um, and one of the ways that this, you know, was sort of vividly displayed was uh, in 1821, the New York State, uh, New York State ratified a new constitution, state con constitution, which effectively disenfranchised most African American men. Um, it, it said that in order to be eligible to vote, black men had to own an estate of $250 or more, which, which meant that they had to have a significant estate and significant capital. Um, and they had to have lived in the state for at least three years. This was a barrier that was not placed on white men. In fact, they were in this time reducing barriers to voting for white men while they were simultaneously increasing the barriers for black men to vote. And it also is uh, critical to recognize that African Americans face all kinds of restrictions on employment opportunities. So the, we have always had a racialized labor system where the certain jobs were, you know, designated for certain races, right? And so that meant that economic opportunity was, could be circumscribed. Uh, was circumscribed. Um, there were, of course, African Americans who started businesses, who were able to obtain land, but, but that was very, very difficult in the socioeconomic system that they were operating in. Uh, and then to conclude, just to sort of carry this forward, what you see after, after 1860 and after the Civil War is that Cooperstown's historic African-American population uh, that had its roots in slavery begins to fade away. That uh, the, the African-Americans who uh, were coming into Cooperstown were not necessarily say, staying, many of them were coming uh, for employment uh, in the hotels, you know, to support the tourism industry. And this photograph is an example of that. These are African-Americans who were working at the Central Hotel, which opened in 1862. Um, and th this was, again, very common throughout the North. It was often actually uh, college students, 
at historically black colleges who to earn money in the summer, they would go to Saratoga or they would come to Cooperstown and they would work and they, and they would make money. There are some examples of some, uh, a, a handful of entrepreneurs, um, a, a, an African-American barber, for example, um, but by and large, you know, African-Americans were restricted to these service type positions. And so if they really wanted, you know, opportunity to put down roots to, uh, to, to grow institutions, they, they, they looked elsewhere. Um, most likely going to, you know, Syracuse, Rochester, Albany, New York City, or even places outside the state. Um, so the, the kind of the end of this story is that you have an African-American population that was present here uh, in particularly in the uh, antebellum period before the Civil War that by the end of the 19th century uh, is really no longer present because of lack of opportunity, lack of uh, community, growth of community institutions and support and, and racism in the area. Some acknowledgements, uh, no, none of this research would be possible without what Hugh McDougall has done, uh, you know, important local historian who's dug through the census and done the legwork to gather a lot of this information. Tom Heights and uh, Sharon Stewart, uh, th their research with, um, uh, in the Freeman's Journal, Again, really, really important in uncovering every shred of evidence. Uh, I would highly recommend an article by a, a former CGP student, student Sylvia Hollis, uh, on African-American workers in Cooperstown. And these are some of the Cooperstown Graduate Program students who worked working with me contributed to this research. That well, was, um Fascinating. Well, thank you very much uh, for presenting that information. Uh, I think for a lot of people that is uh, brand new um, and uh, previously uh, just that, that level of depth about this is, is fantastic. So I really appreciate that. Um, do, do any of the panelists have any questions or comments related to, to Will's um, presentation that they'd like to ask or comment on? Yeah, Will, I, I just had one quick question. Um, what does two hundred dollars equate to in today's economy? Do you have any idea? You're asking the wrong historian. I'm a cultural <laughs> economic historian. Um, okay. It was, it, it was uh, you know, a, a, a young woman would have been highly valued. Uh, unfortunately, because of her reproductive capacity. Um, it, you know, in, in, in 1850, a prime field hand would have been about $1,600. Um, but this is a little earlier than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but $200, it's fair to say, would have been a, a significant investment of capital. Right. And, it, and that $250 sort of barrier um, to being able to vote is just, it's incredible. It's, it's really, a, that's a lot of money. So uh, just kind of stunned by that. But that was in New York too, amazing. Any other comments or questions from the panel? Okay. Namita, were there any? Uh, Question: I, I'm seeing um, I'm seeing again some general questions that we that might we might save at the end. But I do see one question about um, how to address the lack of diversity within Cooperstown, which I think thinking about the history um, in sort of uh, uh, especially sort of over the last hundred two hundred years, um, that sort of points to how we've become you know the, the community that we are today. Um, I guess one of my questions uh, sort of jumping off of, of, of this sort of question of the $250 sort of um, need to vote. Um, do they have, do they have any uh, records of how many men were eligible to, to, to vote under that kind of criteria? Yes. And I don't have that off the top of my head, but um, I mean, it was, it was an effort that lasted decades to challenge this. In fact, um, Frederick Douglass, was uh, lobbying in 1860 
to, to get rid of this. When, when he was campaigning for Lincoln for president, he was also campaigning for New York state voters to remove this requirement and it failed. So in 1860, mm -hmm. New York elected Abraham Lincoln, but they voted down African-American enfranchisement. Wow. The, um, the abolitionist Garrett Smith, who was from Peterborough, not far from here, uh, or lived in Peterborough, um, he actually purchased land, he took some of his land in, uh, up near Lake Placid in what's called North Elba. And if you go up there now, there's a, a state historic site, John Brown State Historic Site. Um, and he, he, he set this land aside for African Americans, free African Americans to go to cultivate the land so they would, so they would meet the property holding requirements so they could vote. Not that many uh, as people, as you might imagine, decided to go up to the Adirondacks to try to make their way there. Um, but John Brown, the abolitionist, the white abolitionist did, he took his family up there and kind of dumped them there. And uh, another family, the Epps family, uh, moved up there and stayed and became, you know, friends with the, with the Brown family. Um, so there were various efforts to challenge this, but it, 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 it you know, they were unsuccessful. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, okay, so why don't we uh, move along to um, Dan Maskin? Would you like to um, do your presentation now? Sure. And thank you, uh, Lee and Will, for um, those compelling presentations. And now I get to talk about census data. So um, here we go. Um, Opportunities for Otsego every three years uh, uh, publishes a community needs assessment. Um, basically looking at a lot of data in areas of employment, housing, uh, businesses, uh, nutrition, healthcare, things like that as it relates to poverty. Um, and then from there, when we do our needs assessment becomes the basis of how we develop and do strategic planning for the next few years in the organization. Um, we were due to have a new one this year in 2020, but we decided to wait a year um, so at least um, we could look at some preliminary census data uh, from the 2020 census. So we, we also published a, um, do you hear those sirens? Okay, I live on Main Street in Oneonta, so they'll, they'll be gone in a minute. We can so, still hear you fine. <laughs> okay, okay. So anyway, so uh, we put out a supplement um, that um, has a lot of data on the impacts of COVID-19 um, in, in Otsego County that will be uh, published soon. Um, so, but when I was looking at the poverty data, getting ready for this presentation, um, the poverty rate in Otsego County is 15 and a half percent. But when you break it down by race, um, whites living in poverty is 14.5%. Blacks or African Americans living in poverty is 37%. And people who listed as multi race um, is at 27.1%. Um, and when you look at median income, the median income in Otsego County uh, is $53,121. Um, whites earn $287 over the median income. Uh, blacks or African Americans earn $10,349 or $350 below the median income. And multi uh, multi races um, are uh, one thousand four hundred and fifty below the median income. So, um, so I think it, I think it's I think it's telling, and I think it's important that we break our general data down um, and, and and look at things across a wider uh, matrix of um, of how different populations are affected in our community. Um, 
And within opportunities for Atsego, uh, we serve uh, approximately 3,500 3, individuals um, a year. Um, uh, and while the, the percentage of whites in Otsego County is 94%, um, the percentage of, those, of all of those receiving services that are white at OFO is 88%. Um, and while the county's uh, per percentage of Blacks or African Americans is 1.9%, um, the uh, Blacks or African Americans that receive services are 2.61% uh, of all those that we serve. And in multi, multi, multiracial, it's 1.8% for the county and about almost 5% at OFO. So I think it's important to keep in mind and what I'm sort of kind of delving into over, over the course of the next few months is that you know, although the largest percentage of Otsego County residents are white, um, it, it, it's not always safe to assume that we really don't have issues or problems in our community, um, because because just because the numbers are relatively small. Um, uh, but when you break down certain demographics, you can begin to see the disparities along racial lines. Um, so um, while we're going to be doing our next needs assessment in 2021, um, and we'll, I'm going to intend to put emphasis on um, looking at racial disparities within categories. So for example, um, we can report on the number of Otsego County residents who are homeless, but in that report, we don't break that down by race or, or, or ethnicity necessarily. So, um, um, sort of, you know, stay tuned as we begin to start developing that data. Um, the current needs assessment is on our website. Leanne, is there a way I can put that in the chat or something that you can share that? Um, or, and, yeah. um, okay, I'll do that. And then um, I'll also put my email up if people want to reach out and if they have any questions they want to answer me uh, directly. So um, with yeah, that, I'll we turn will, it back to our moderators. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what we'll do is um, we will have links to um, the community needs assessment and anything, any sort of resources that as panelists you want to share, we'll have that on the Friends of the Village Library website. Great. It may not happen right away, but it will definitely be there. But um, the, I know that the, the website for Opportunities for Otsego fairly easy to remember is ofoinc.org, ofoinc.org. Uh, so that's a, a good one to go to. Um, are as there- my daughter, uh, as my daughter affectionately calls it ofoinc. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, that's great. Um, that's uh, great information, um, Dan, and bringing it up to the present, I think that, uh, um, the fact that, you know, starting with Will's discussion about um, how the, the African American population came to this area as slaves and the fact that here we still see, you know, a, a, that the, the po poverty um, is much higher among the, uh, the black population in this, in this county just, I think, speaks to um, systemic racism. Um, pretty clearly to me. Uh, and uh, one thing, I, I don't know if others have any questions or, or comments for Dan in the, in the panel, anybody have? I'm actually, I'm seeing some questions from the audience um, and there's, there's mm -hmm. actually been a mix of questions and I think those directed to, to various of our panelists. Um, but just to follow mm -hmm. on, on, on Dan's talk, I think there's been a question just to sort of, um, I, I guess maybe say more about your last comment that just because Otsego County is mostly white, it doesn't mean we don't have our share of problems. I guess there was some. Well, I, I mean, I, I hear um, from time to time over the years that people say that there's really no issue, racial issues or uh, things like that in our community because um, there are so few uh, black or African-American citizens that because the numbers are so small that it's really not a problem here. 
And I, th I just, you know, and again, I'm just reporting on data. I'm not really coming up, I'm not really coming to any conclusions or making any predictions or things like that. But I think it's just important that even, you know, even if the, the, the numbers are small, that there are still, there are still issues. I think there was a question regarding, let's see. Um, I saw some questions that were directed towards some of our earlier panelists. So I'm wondering if maybe after Jennifer's mm -hmm. um, discussion, we can sort of just sort of go through them all and, and, and have everybody uh, respond mm -hmm. accordingly. I do have that um, there's a couple different um, people who provided calculations um, on what is $200, what would it be now? Yes. And it seems to vary between, you know, 4,000 to uh, uh, 5,650. So uh, depending on the calculator you use. So it is a significant amount of, of money. Um, and let's There's see. also and a more specific you. question about when the barriers to voting were dropped, which maybe if Will has a risk or if anybody has a, an answer to that one. 15th Amendment in 1870. 1870, wow. <laughs> great, okay. Um, great, so why don't we uh, um, have Jennifer um, take the, the cleanup position here for the presentations. Take it away, Jennifer. Hey, thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, thanks to Will and Dan and Lee for kind of providing a foundation. I can really only speak on current issues. So thank you for kind of building that up. Um, I hadn't planned on doing this, but I want to address the two poll questions that were first, um, you know, thrown out as this was first started. And hopefully most of you saw that. Um, I'm going to address the actions you can take in a little bit. So we'll get to that. Um, the second one, asking if racism is present in Cooperstown. Great to see 76% said yes, um, but there was 2% that said no and 22% that said that they were not sure. Just to let you know, it's here. Whether you don't see individual acts, racism is in every single community in this country because this country is built on racist ideals. So just because you don't see a person of color in Cooperstown having actions taken against them doesn't mean that racism isn't here. So we'll get to that. Um, just want to talk quick about the Say Their Names Memorial, and I think that's why I was invited here on this panel. Um, that was installed just this past Saturday. It's on the first baseline of Doubleday Field. And what Say Their Names Memorial is, is it started in Portland, Oregon in June by a woman named Joy Proctor. And it has been a grassroots movement that has spread across the country. It is photos and names of, now it's over 200 people of color that have passed from either police brutality or just racial injustice in general. Um, when I installed the memorial on Saturday, we have 217 names and photos on the wall. Um, what the purpose of this memorial is, is just to start number one, educating yourselves and doing some research on people that guaranteed you've never heard of. There are, you know, the obvious Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s, Malcolm X, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, they're up there, but there are people that I had never heard of and guaranteed nobody in this audience has ever heard of. Um, so I encourage everyone, please, go take a look, it's up there until December 1st. Um, I just actually saw about an hour before this started that Syracuse is going to be installing their own version of the memorial on October 14th. So kind of seek that out. Every town, every city does it in a different way. And Cooperstown is by far the smallest town that this has been installed in. So you see in Los Angeles, in New York City and Dallas and Seattle, but then here it is in Cooperstown. So I think that speaks volumes about the, our community. And also 
Um, so I started this process in the end of July, went through the Board of Trustees in Cooperstown, and everything was smooth sailing. I did not have any hurdles. I had one small question, which was a valid question, but um, when this memorial, the same exact memorial was installed in Oneana, unfortunately the young woman that was organizing it um, encountered many hurdles and many problems from all different walks of life. Um, we won't get into exact details, it became very public. So I was a little hesitant when bringing it to Cooperstown, but the mayor, the board, the police chief, everybody was more than willing to have this here. So I wanna just publicly thank them. Um, as this memorial was forming, I had people directly reach out to me, of course, through social media and ask questions like, why here? Why are you bringing this to Cooperstown? And not gonna get into, you know, back and forth with them. All I would say was, why not? Why not Cooperstown? Why does it need to be in a big city like New York City? Um, when the murder of George Floyd happened, I had this overwhelming just anxiety over, I wanna do something, but that's way out there. What can I do to help? And I believe Mr. Fisher talked about, you need to start locally. You need to look into your own town. I saw Mrs. Gilbert, she posted a question about the signs in Gilbertsville. We organized a very peaceful rally in Gilbertsville. Wonderful people showed up. I met some of the most amazing people in Gilbertsville. I had never been to Gilbertsville. It's 10 minutes down the road. Just met some amazing people there that are super supportive of their town. But unfortunately, the ones that have the signs out there are usually the loud ones. And the ones that are really supportive of this movement become afraid and become bullied. Please don't do that. Keep taking action. So thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. Um, other questions that were raised to me during this memorial or during the organi organization of the memorial, um, actually it wasn't a question. I had numerous people tell me there is no racism in Cooperstown. This memorial doesn't belong here because racism doesn't exist here. Um, I can give exact details and exact examples of how racism is in Cooperstown. I born and ra born and raised in Cooperstown, went there to went to school K through 12. I now have two sons who are there, a senior and a sophomore, both of them biracial. Both of them have had instances of racism, direct racism in that school and in this community. So when people tell me that racism doesn't exist, it absolutely does. Um, also had questions, um, why aren't you doing a memorial for fallen policemen? Why aren't you doing a memorial for abducted children? Why aren't you doing a memorial? And you know, the options kept going on and on. My response is, go for it. If you feel impassioned about a certain cause, I will help you organize it. I will be up there putting it up, but do not take away from the importance of this memorial right now. And the deflection is um, very common with people that don't quite understand this movement. They will try to deflect something else. Um, and I also had um, a community member come up to me and say, maybe there's a different way we can go about this memorial. Maybe if we included some white people, maybe if we included um, police officers, which there are police officers on this memorial, just to let everyone know, um, because it's going to make this community feel uncomfortable. And I said, exactly. You need to feel uncomfortable. There won't be change until the majority starts to feel uncomfortable. And there won't be change until the majority accepts this problem as their own. The minority can't do it on their own. They've tried, so they need help. And that circles back to the actions, you know, people wanna know what can we do to help? What can we do acceptable for any of us white people to just not be racist. That's 
It's a right step. It's, a, it's an important first step, but you now need to become anti-racist. And anti-racist is taking daily, and I check myself on a daily basis. You need to not only be against racism, but take actions to do something against the inequality. So just to show up is no longer not enough. Thank you for showing up. All of the people that continue to show up to protests and rallies and memorials, so grateful. Thank you. But now you need to do the next step. You need to organize something of your own. You need to get into schools and talk to them. You need to organize youth groups. You need to do something more because complacency isn't working anymore. And especially here in Cooperstown where literally my sons are the diversity, the more community members need to step up and say, I've got your back. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. You know, if you have any issues, I'm here, I'm, a, I'm an ear, but then take the next steps also. And all part of that is, again, becoming anti-racist, but also realizing how privileged we all are. And I'm not talking about money at all. All of us that have a white skin tone or just appear white. I have some black in me. I did the whole DNA test. I do, but obviously I pass as white. I need to recognize my privilege and use it to my benefit and use it to the benefit of this movement. And if I can suggest, please, 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 everybody out there, um, read Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. It is by Peggy McIntosh and she perfectly explains what white privilege is. Um, just a couple examples. So she was working on a gender equality um, research project and she got thinking and got realizing how close the, the racial inequality fight was so well connected to gender inequality. And she starts this article or this research paper by saying, I was taught to see racism only in individual acts of meanness, not in invisible systems conferring dominance on my group. It, racism isn't direct scenarios or direct objects or direct, it is a whole system that we don't see, most of us don't see um, on a daily basis. And so she gives examples of what white privilege is that she has just recognized. And she gives, let's see, I believe it's 50. Yes, it's 50 different everyday thing that happens. So I'm just gonna randomly pick. Um, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of race of my most of the time. I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. I can be pretty sure that if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I will be facing a person of my race. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. I can speak in public to a powerful male group without putting my race on trial. I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to feeling somewhat tied in rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, held at a distance or feared. Those are just a few. She lists 50. Um, it's, I can worry about racism without being seen as self-interested or self-seeking. I can be late to a meeting without having the lateness reflect on my race. It, it goes on and on and on. So realizing those small things that happen to us every day, every single day, that is the most important first step you can take. Self-reflection every single day. So like I said, from the time I wake up, it can be exhausting. It can be absolutely exhausting, but it's needed. Every action I take, I said, oh, I can do that because I'm white. Every single day. I can do that comfortably, or I can do that without fear because of my skin color. 
So Cooperstown, that's what you need to do. Recognize your white privilege. It is, doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's something that we can't control. We were born with it, right? So accept it, realize it, and then start helping others that don't have that privilege. Um, so yeah, so please just educate yourself and work on the being anti-racist and not just not racist and uh, working on just accepting, realizing, and using the white privilege uh, for positive change. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That's fantastic. Um, do, do any of the uh, panelists have any questions or comments for that are specific to Jennifer's presentation? Well, I just, I just wanted to say, can you hear me okay? Is it yeah. all right? Okay. Um, Jennifer, f fantastic. You know, uh, Will, Dan, great job. Um, yes, don't think because you're living in upstate New York. A lot of people do not know. I came here in 1964. And I can see uh, some people looking and saying, I wasn't even born then, you know. <laughs> so now I was. <laughs> oh, be nice, be nice. <laughs> but at 1964, I walked down the um, I walked down the hallway of the school that I taught in, in Davenport. The kids were in a straight line. You know how teachers keep the little kids and they had their little lunch pails and everything. And I came out of the office and I think every single kid dropped their lunch pail and looked up at me and wanted to know, what is he? Who is he? Now, not that they didn't see things on TV, you know, I mean, Mr. Rogers tried to do his best, you know, but uh, it wasn't enough because there wasn't much on TV in 1964 that anything that looked like me. But I mean, that was the start. But what a great experience I had for 32 years. One of the reasons was the person that I met who was the superintendent. And I came from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, five and a half hours away, met in Binghamton for the interview with Mr. Donald Haight. I mean, just an absolute wonderful man who told me that, Lee, this, is, this might be tough. Now, 1964, that's before the assassination uh, of um, Martin Luther King. But when he told me, I have your back. And when he responded, the way he responded, it just went through the whole school. And I'll tell you one other story. I couldn't find his house when I first came here. So I went to, I was going down Route 23, and there was a flag that was in front of this big white house. And he told me to look for Davenport Center. So uh, he said it was not too far from Davenport Center. So I went up to the house, you know, and knocked on the door. The TV was on very loud because it was an older man who had problems hearing. It was on loud, you know, and he, he said to me, I think it was around, it was around maybe eight o'clock and this is daylight saving time. And I knocked on the door and he said, who is out there this time of night? Okay, I'm coming from a city. I go into, I, I knock on the door. He, first of all, he opened the door wide. And then when he saw it was me, he closed it real quick with his foot, just enough to have his mouth. So what do you want? And I said, I'm looking for uh, Mr. Donald Haight. 
And right away, the door swung open wide, and he said, you must be that teacher they're talking about that's coming to our school district. You know, I said, yes, and I told him my name. He told me where the house was. That was my first introduction to, to Davenport, you know? I mean, you know, it, it's just what Jennifer said. You start where you are. It's a mirror. You have to look at yourself. When you see programs on TV, what goes through your mind when you see a person of color? When you see newscasts that come in, how do you judge what's going on when you're watching those newscasts to say, see, I told you, and then get all fired up without finding out the real history behind some of these um, protests that are taking place. Some of them are planned. Some of them, they, they, they showed where people were arrested. They weren't even from that area. They were the ones that had the, uh, the bottles and cocktails and everything. Through. So, you know, you have to find out. And one thing I'd like to tell the audience, you must read history and read the true history of how racism started in America and why it is so deeply rooted in American lives today. And say to yourself, I do not want to be part of it. I can't think of people who live every day hating another person. What type of lifestyle is that? When they go through life hating as much as some of these people do. So I've said enough, but you understand what we're, what we're saying. Yes, racism is in every area of this country. Yeah, that, that is very true. Um, Namita, did you uh, have any questions that I know we have? Looks like we've got about I'm seven seeing, minutes. Yeah, I'm seeing uh, a lot of questions from the audience, actually, and I'm, I, I wish we had time to go through all of them, but I'm going to try to see if we can try to sort of summarize things uh, a little yep. bit. There were some comments of, uh, asking about Bud Fowler, but then someone also put in comments about how um, the Say Their Names installation is actually on Bud Fowler Lane in Cooperstown. Um, and so I don't know if, if, if anybody wants any more details about that. There's some, some discussion about diversity in Cooperstown and sort of the uh, relationship to the professional life here, which is something to think about. And then there's a question about whether um, the lack of diversity in and around Cooper, Cooperstown is a form of racism as we are systematically underdeveloped and making people of color wish to move or, or live here. So I guess whether there's some underlying sort of, um, um, I guess, um, issue that sort of contributes to diversity beyond what we sort of our panelists have, have brought up today. Um, and then one other thing that I thought was was maybe something interesting, uh, an interesting part of a, a comment that we mentioned earlier with those uh, racist signs in Gilbertsville. And again, sort of um, referring back to Lee's earlier comments about how this is everywhere in the small towns and Jennifer's sort of comments about how we all need to think about these things. And I think a lot of these comments and a lot of our discussions revolve around individual action and individual ideas. But this comment is also bringing up the, the silence of the churches and the American Legion to these signs. And I think that brings up the role of institutions. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering if panelists have anything to say about, um, in particular, the, 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 the interplay between institutions and individuals and what we can do as individuals to recognize and start to make changes in institutions. Well, I think if we go back to kind of the, the mid 19th century, you can see an effort on the part of local African Americans to perhaps begin to create some of that 
infrastructure, right? Some, some institutions, some kind of anchor businesses. And unfortunately, it's not, it's not successful, right? We don't know what happened to Hayden Waters uh, after uh, the early 1830s. He disappears entirely from the historical record. Um, but, uh, you know, in other places, you do have that. You know, if you look at Rochester, for example, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it has important Black institutions that date back to the 19th century, you know. And so it, when we think about institutions, definitely in terms of Cooperstown, you know, I, I think that we, we have to interrogate the institutions that we operate within and, and think about racism there. But I think there's another way to think about, you know, creating institutions within African American communities that provide the kind of support that enables a community to persist for a long period of time. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, I, I know that I, I think from an employment perspective, and I think that was one of the questions is, you know, are we uh, making it such that people of uh, people of color um, would would like to live here, um, and when they see a lack of diversity, I think that that is an issue. Um, I know that um, for um, artists who are invited, say, for to perform at a concert here, some of those who some of the um, African American artists have said, you know. I don't know if I'm comfortable. I mean, or if I come here, I feel if I walk down the street, I'm the only black person walking down the street and that makes me really uncomfortable. And, you know, I'll just, you know, eat dinner in my, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to eat out because it makes me really uncomfortable. So I, I think there is an issue there. And, and, and I think there is a need to make a more concerted effort. It isn't enough just to say, well, you know, we are an equal opportunity, say, employer, and that's, and the, if somebody doesn't apply, well, gee, at least we've done our effort. I think there has to be a greater effort than that um, to to bring in people. And I, I think that, that Bassett, um, as one of the, as probably the largest employer in the area, has uh, brought more diversity to um, the Cooperstown area than we would have had otherwise, and we've been pretty fortunate in that. But I don't think that, I think maybe one of the concerns, and, and we'll be talking uh, about that in the healthcare section, is, is are they staying? Mm -hmm. You know, they may come, but then they may not stay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know if anybody else has some thoughts on that. Well, Oniana, we have been uh, very fortunate to have you know, the college is there and with all the students that come from uh, larger urban areas, um, showing more diversity uh, in, our, in our city. Um, but along with that, we do see um, sort of spikes in um, racism. Um, I think uh, uh, Jennifer mentioned people don't even realize that you have a code. When when Job Corps students were coming into, uh, and I don't mean to mention their names, but at, uh, anyway, I did it. And uh, but when they when they uh, were going into a, a particular store, there was a code that was given on the microphone that their bus had arrived, and they people went on to alert. Instead of them stocking the shelves, now they act like they're stocking the shelves, but they're watching the, the people do their uh, shopping. This happens. Just last year, we had students um, who had their uh, bags, their uh, uh, book uh, uh, bags checked uh, before they left the, they left the store. And they, they called us, the N NAACP, to check into it, and uh, and we did, and we found out that you know it stopped. We have problems with housing, uh, people uh, setting up contracts and and trying to swindle their way out of uh, you know contracts with uh, uh, some of the students of color. So 
you know, there's, there's housing, there's, un, there's employment. We have a couple of things right now on the, on our, uh, on our desks that we're dealing with, with uh, employment in, in Oneonta. So, um, you know, it's here. Well, you, you, we don't, and, and, you know, you might not hear about it, but um, it, it's, it's present. You know, I see two more specific questions. I know we're sort of running towards the end of our time, but um, two more specific questions that maybe could be addressed by some of our panelists a, a, a little bit more briefly. One is just, a, it, there was a question whether some of the local research will that you and your students have done have been shared with the Cooperstown High School teachers. Um, and has, has, has there been any effort to sort of encourage inclusion um, with the teaching in the schools? And then there's another question of, of whether there's any data on Otsego County or Cooperstown police arrests in terms of race, if there's a breakdown by race um, available. I could say uh, we have not had much um, interaction with uh, with the Cooperstown schools, but uh, you know, it, I did was successful a few years ago in having. Um, one of the social studies teachers kind of come and be part of one of our programs and bring some students. Um, but that is certainly something we could do more with. Of course, the, all of this research is uh, part of the Martin Luther King Day program um, that we've been doing for the past four years, and that is open to the public, so anybody can come. And, and there have been uh, high school students involved in, in that program. So in that way, yes, but uh, certainly be open to conversations about how some of this could be brought into and the local history curriculum in the schools. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, it, are there any, uh, I guess we're hitting, we're actually a little past our time, so I don't want to keep people longer. Um, so uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. I think there was one on Bud Fowler. Um, I have uh, an answer on there's a question about Bud Fowler, who though wasn't born in Cooperstown, um, he lived here for a while and he was a um, uh, pioneering uh, and persevering baseball player. Um, and so, and I don't remember when the Bud Fowler way was um, created, but it wasn't that long ago. I think it's a fairly recent uh, thing that happened. I don't know, Jennifer, do you know about that by any chance? I don't remember the exact year. I don't remember. Fairly recent. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so I don't want to keep people longer. Uh, I'm seeing that it's a little past eight thirty. So um, so why don't we? Uh, I'm going to just have my final little thoughts um, to share with you. So give me a moment here to share. Uh, let's see. Go to. Let's see. I have to go find my spot here. Okay, so I just want to thank um, the panelists and um, and and Anita for um, a, this is just a really interesting and a great start to this whole series um, and and also the the friends of the village library of Cooperstown the the looking in the mirror committee and uh, also the friends of the village library of Cooperstown board and the village library of Cooperstown board who all approve this um, without reservation and we're very excited to be part of this uh, and then I also want to bring up just what's next uh, so on uh, the 30th, um, we've got uh, the first session is, this next session is, uh, next week is Cooper Center Reflects on Racism and Tourism. Uh, and that'll be with um, Tim Mead, Jim Miles, Cassandra Harrington, uh, Cindy Rodriguez, and uh, Dietra Harvey will be joining us with Molly Mead, uh, Molly Myers as our um, co-moderator. And then on the 15th, um, we'll have Cooperstown Reflects on Racism in Education with uh, Mary Bondaroff, uh, Re Rebecca Cialo, and Angela Eldred. 
uh, Dr. Uh, or Bill Crankshaw um, and Luval Brown. And finally, uh, on the 28th, we will have Cooperstown Reflecting on Racism uh, and Health Care with uh, Reggie Knight, Sue Bashini Dan Daniel, uh, Jim Dalton, and Vince Solomon, as well as, um, uh, and, and our co-moderator will be, um, oh, why am I having trouble with the name? Candace Shannon as well. So that, that's what we've got coming up. And then, as I said, in January, February 2021, we're going to be um, covering the, the topics of law enforcement, housing and historic preservation, culture and the arts, and um, sort of an, uh, taking a look at, so what actions can we take? You can uh, register for those at fovl.eventbrite.com. And then if you do have any questions or comments afterwards, um, you can email fovlfriends. 22 main at gmail.com. So uh, I think that concludes our series today. And I just want to thank everybody for uh, taking part and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thank, thank you, Leanne. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Have a good one.